one person like you to lead that fight. According to the 2006 African Youth Charter, youth or young people refers to every person between the age of 15 and 35. In that regard, I am myself a youth. And when I received this invitation to come here and speak with you on an issue which I have been passionate about for several years, I took it uh, as a mission. I had to fly all the way from Mauritius back home and be here in two days so that we can all discuss this together. This initiative is both timely and extremely relevant to the trajectory of Africa's development. Africa is on the verge of being defeated by corruption and had and continues to, to gravely suffer the attendant consequences of the prevalence of graft. This consultation is part of efforts to re-energize and synergize our anti-corruption cooperation with a view to reposition the future of Africa to avert a looming crushing defeat by corruption. Africa is home to about 1.2 billion people. Over 60% of its population falls under the age of 35. Therefore, we have the greatest effect on all national issues of governance, especially corruption. We are the biggest factor, the engine of all successful states. Hence, we are duty bound to do something to change the status quo. But there are times when I think that some people do not really understand the gravity of what confronts us. And the impossibility of progress we will endure if we do not collectively put our, our weights behind the fight against corruption. Corruption violates the very foundations of democratic governance when individuals snatch collective good for individual benefit. It is when those in charge of building schools for our children pilfer the resources and fewer or no schools are built. As a result, our children remain uneducated and cannot employ their full potential towards national development. It is when officers in charge of building state-of-the-art hospitals siphon allocated resources and plant substandard alternatives in their place, knowing that those cannot cater to the medical needs of the people of their respective countries. Consequently, Corruption keeps us underdeveloped and leads to preventable death of our people at genocidal magnitude. Given the reality, it is not again saying that corruption represents the biggest inhibitor of Africa's competitiveness in the world. There are clear nexuses between corruption and poverty in Africa, corruption and diseases, corruption and illiteracy, Corruption and wars, corruption and bad governance, unsustainable economic growth, peace, security, and the stability of the continent. It is a reality everywhere we look. With more prevalence in some countries than others. It is by reason of the foregoing and many more that we cannot waver in our resolve to fight this cancerous malaise that has plagued Africa since the end of colonialism. Every year, our leaders bargain in our interest, and we receive the short end of those bargains. Sometimes, the grand scale of the collusion makes us powerless going forward. In many instances, the very watchdogs who are supposed to uphold our interest against corruption officers collude in such criminal enterprise by our leaders. With all that has been done, from Kebab to Djibouti, from the Strait of Gibraltar, 
to the Cape of Good Hope, we advertise corruption with the attendant poverty that goes with it. In Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Guinea, Liberia, corruption continues to negatively hamper efforts aimed at promoting democratic governance. In South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Uganda, and Malawi, corruption continues to undermine socioeconomic transformation. In Nigeria, Somalia, Central Africa Republic, Cameroon, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Chad, Mali, and the DRC, corruption continues to undermine the peace and security of our people. From Gabon in the West to Kenya in the East, corruption continues to degrade Africa. From Uganda in the East to Senegal in the West, corruption and its effects continue to promote conflicts and sow the seeds of disunity and national discord. The seriousness and complexities of the problems are aptly captured in the Africa Progress Report, otherwise known as the Becky Report. This high power panel on illicit financial flows from Africa revealed that Africa loses 50 billion annually to illicit financial flows and tax evasions. This is far more than what Africa receives in international aid or foreign investment. I hope you noticed that distinct irony. The report also estimates illicit financial flow from Africa between 1970 to 2008 at nearly 900 billion. That money is not simply disappearing into the wing like magic. It is mostly going into the pockets of individuals and groups, thereby depriving parents of food for their families, medicine for children, classroom for our youth, and portable water for communities, etc. The late Kofi Annan succinctly captured this. May he so rest in peace when he said, while personal fortunes are consolidated by a corrupt few, the vast majority of Africa's, of Africa's present and future generation are being deprived of the benefits of common resources that might otherwise deliver incomes, livelihood, and better nutrition. If these problems are not addressed, we are sowing the seeds of a bitter harvest. Today, as part of that bitter, bitter harvest, Africa imports 34 billion worth of food. 34 billion worth of food is what we import. We have hungry stomachs everywhere working on fertile soils. Even though we have potentials to feed ourselves within five years if agricultural productivity is improved. We need an estimated 50 billion annually to do our roads, railways, and other public investment projects. So if the leakages are properly plugged, we would not need aid or loans from our competitors to effectively deliver services to the public. The Africa Progress Report also estimates that Africa loses about 17 billion annually from illegal logging alone. While fishing fleets flouting international conventions are costing West Africa alone $1.3 billion annually. These costs are, driving, are driven by corruption in most parts. In a report titled Western Africa's Missing Fish, Britain's Overseas Development Institute reported that Africa loses billions of dollars because corrupt Africans, state operatives enter into shady deals with foreign countries. The FAO even went further to reveal that the sale of fishing rights to foreign operatives netted Africa 400 million in 2014, but in theory could have generated $3.3 billion if Africa exports its own fish catch instead. I believe these revealing statistics are enough to help you all picture how we are in conflict, undermining efforts aim at attaining global sustainable development goals and agenda 2063, Africa's 50-year developmental agenda. There is no greater threat to attaining that agenda than corruption. On a progressive note, however, as more and more African countries realize that their development will be stunted if they fail to root out corruption, a wind of change is blowing across Africa. And it is in the interest of well-meaning citizens 
to join to help create a society where everyone has equal rights to public goods. Many states have instituted accountability measures and created anti-corruption agencies to ensure that resources trickle down to the people. Cape Verde, Mauritius, Rwanda, Botswana, etc., amongst countries that respectively that respectively lie in indices that matter on corruption control. Similarly, the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption has provided a continental backbone to efforts of member states in our fight against corruption. Of course, many African states are also party to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. A united front against corruption is building, and it is good that young people are not staying behind. And that is why we are all here. Many young people do not only have the desire and capacity to transform the world, but also the potential to positively affect anti-corruption reforms. As a new generation of politicians, entrepreneurs, and civil society actors, youths and young people have an important role to play in bringing a new culture of integrity to all levels of African society, especially given the fact that youths and young people are also the most vulnerable to the effect of corruption in Africa. I am sure we are all aware of the people who are engaging in temple runs, dying in seas, running after gold that lies somewhere that they have never seen. The platform, the impetus for that to happen is the corruption that, that is in Africa that is depriving them of a good life that they think they can seek elsewhere. And they are running to their deaths in European waters. Therefore, youth and young people should be taught to effectively direct, prevent, and fight corruption. To this end, it is highly significant to devise appropriate empowerment strategies to raise the awareness, levels, and understanding of corruption, and the way it undermines democratic societies, and at the same time, build their capacities to stand up and fight against corruption. Critical to providing authoritative responses to the questions from the objectives of this consultative conference is the constitution and propagation of proper and sustainable state-of-the-art education on corruption, backed by an unflinching commitment by young people to refuse to reject and report corruption at all levels and in all jurisdictions of the continent. Such education should target primary, secondary school educations, colleges, and universities. Anti-corruption policy making should improve youth capacity to unveil and, and oppose corruption. Relevant youth organizations should contribute to framing and implementing anti-corruption policies. The overall objective is to achieve quality education that is aimed at effectively addressing corruption. Relevant sectors of society should be targeted to fully commit to fundamental ethical principles of public and personal life. The AU Advisory Board on Corruption should take the leadership in defining the broad educational policy framework and setting the blueprint. To this end, it is highly important to develop appropriate empowerment strategies to raise youth awareness and understanding of the undermining effects of corruption. At the same time, build their capacities to stand up against it. However, for the board to effectively discharge its duty, it has to expand its staff strength and also have the capacity it does. Our leaders need to support that drive. The evidence is glaring Africa loses too much to corruption, sustained and perpetrated by bad governance. Lack of accountability and transparency is staple in Africa nowadays. Resources meant for the people of Africa, but stolen and pocketed by corrupt actors, will have gone a long way to reduce infant mortality, maternal mortality, infections like malaria, cholera, among others, and the provision of vaccines for deadly outbreaks like Ebola, which at its point almost was threatening making West Africa extinct. Despite the potentials in our human and natural resources, the poverty rate in Africa is alarming. The irony of Africa is best illustrated in the phrase, poverty amidst plenty. 
the richest, yes, the poorest continent. Various studies have supported the position that if we seriously maximize our revenue mobilization, utilize our resources judiciously by negating corruption and corrupt practices of all kinds, it will be extreme for Africa to need foreign loans or aid. We can build our own schools, equip our own hospitals with best brains, best equipment, best medicines available. Now is the time for us to make the positive difference as young people. Let us make it happen. Where else can victory be harvested if not from us? We have to make it happen. The positive difference Africa has been yearning for can be realized through us. For our discussion that follows, a thorough look at the concept paper shows a number of expected outcomes intended to fix the problem. The first expected outcome touches and borders on enhancing individual programming of AU advisory board on corruption and other AU organs and REC's working on corruption transparency and accountability issues. To that end, we should keep in mind that youth, function, youth do not function as homogeneous entities. Therefore, in designing programs, policies, and legislations, we should take cognizance of the fact that youth of yesterday, today, and tomorrow have different perspectives, aspirations, and motivations. Accordingly, into consideration that diversity. For the second expected outcome, which focuses on enhancing efforts towards meaningful youth engagement in prevention efforts, youth and young people should focus and remain engaged in anti graft activities at all levels. They must be included and made integral stakeholders in any national policy development and implementation of anti corruption strategies. We must move away from using youth as mere statistics. People must not only be made to know that they own the processes, they must actually own it. Additionally, youth and young people are arguably more creative in their approach to problem solving, especially with modern innovations and technology which youth and young people are more industrious in dealing with. Youth can positively impact global anti-corruption initiatives and be more forward-thinking in a way that is better for use of modern innovations and technology in this important fight. For the third expected outcome, which focuses on documentation of youth-led and youth-focused anti-corruption initiatives, the AU should set up national networks where young people can share their experiences and knowledge about corruption and corrupt practices, disseminate good practices, and devise proposals for future action consistent with objective one. We should introduce integrity studies from the earliest age in the national schools and university curricula, including both aspects of personal values and ethical behavior through a human rights-based approach. For the fourth expected outcome, we deal with facilitation and establishment of youth community and practice. Regional and continental institutions, states should introduce appropriate legislations or bring national legislations in line with international, regional, and sub-regional anti-corruption instruments. African states should offer more and more training to young people in support areas like filmmaking, journalism, writing, photography, etc., to enable them to become a relay to, to disseminate the values of transparency, integrity, and good governance. It is my settled view that these expected outcomes can only be achieved through democratic and good governance in which state institutions are made the cornerstone of governance. So back home in Sierra Leone, as commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission, I have established an approach that I call the radical transparency drive. The object is to quickly reverse the scourge of corruption. Youth and young people are leading the way in my strategy. 
This approach constitutes a comprehensive method of fighting corruption, focusing on nine pillars, the use of young people, public awareness, anti-corruption strategies, public participation, watchdog agencies, the judiciary, the media, the private sector, and international cooperation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the final question is now how to harness the enormous potential in this room here. The good news is that those of you gathered here are already ahead of your peers in this fight. The onus is on you to return to your countries and ignite the ferment of change in favor of an honest, fair, and just society, the African society. As we lead here, as we lead here with the goal to lead transformative agenda of the continent, let us take seriously the words of Franz Fanon, who said, each generation must discover its mission, to feel it or betray it in relative capacity. If our mission is to be drivers of anti-corruption revolution on the continent, we must follow the following guide. Let us not firstly be corrupt. You cannot allow yourselves to do in private what you condemn in public. Advocates for better pay for public officers. It is only when people are well paid that we will have started the preventive approach to fighting corruption. Then they have no excuse. Even though I still believe there is no excuse for corruption. We should explore innovative methods of transactions. There have been many significant technology innovations that could be useful in the fight against corruption. The fight against corruption is going to need your innovative technological skills to transform both our governance structures, review our systems and processes, and negate those that facilitate and fear corruption. We should report corruption. We can learn from the American airport campaign against terrorism in our fight against corruption. When you see something, say something. Above all, live with integrity. This com comes back to the idea of what you do when no one is watching you. In conclusion, when you examine the numbers within the past decade, our continent has not made much progress in the fight against corruption. We are recorded as the most corrupt and poorest continent in the world. The numbers are bleak. It is shameful to say the least. Nonetheless, the future is not unwelcoming at all. And the road to viable change in Africa is not clogged with impossibilities. It just needs our collective will and action. I see a bright light at the end of the tunnel with you all sitting here. I can see you all clearly. In your eyes, there is a rejuvenation of what Africa ought to really be. With you young people on the side of justice, on the side of truth, on the side of human rights, and firmly on the side of integrity and accountability, Africa is ready for a massive change. The answer lies with us. We have the master key to unlock the true potentials of Africa as young people. I call on all policymakers within the African Union, the AU heads of states, and regional and sub regional leaders to empower and allow youth to lead in the governance of Africa. Our time is not tomorrow, our time is now. We should be taught and capacitated to effectively detect, prevent, and fight corruption. The moment is now for the young people to drive the change we need so that we can give Africa a new direction. Now is the time for Africa to turn long-haired aspirations into concrete and innovative actions. We, the youth and young people, should say zero tolerance to corruption. Fortune sides with those who dare. Let us dare corruption and fight it arm to the teeth to resist it when it retaliates. Corruption is the urgency 
of today. And it is the emergency of Africa's tomorrow. Our generation must take collective action against the cancer of corruption. As it stands, Africa's greatest hope lies in us. Not the resources that lie under the soils anymore because they have been stolen and sold for next to nothing. Now it's time to stand up and be counted for Africa. Now is the time to save our collective future or watch it perish like our parents. Together, let us make corruption in Africa a risky and less profitable venture. Now that we have identified corruption as a common enemy, we must attack it knowing that our very survival rests on defeating it. Every generation has its defining moment. This is ours. Let us unback on this fight decisively and fearlessly. United, we can rid Africa of corruption. Long live Africa. I thank you. I think we can do better than that. Can we put our hands together? Hello. That is a very passionate presentation by Honorable Ben Kaifala. Uh, and I will allow him uh, a few moments to catch his breath um, before I lead us into some form of interaction. But the particular line was very striking for me. And it's that every generation has its defining moment. And that this is ours. Is this really ours? Do we feel and believe that this is our own defining moment? I'm open for a reaction from the hall. Do we think this is our moment? Really? Okay, I think we then have a starting point for our interaction. Because if this is really our moment, and we're already seizing that moment, then why is it that, as Honorable Kaifala mentioned, the progress seems very, very minimal in many areas? So, Honorable Kaifala, my first question to you is, you've been in office for up to a year now. What has been your most surprising realization in office? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I've actually been in office less than that <laughs> because the new president had to appoint me and I took over. But when I was appointed commissioner of the Anti-Corruption Commission, a call which mostly came from young people in the country. Some of them are here. I, I have met a number of their representatives here, and they were all calling that, look, we don't want anything from the new president. We just won the anti-corruption fight. And our candidate for that position is Francis Kaifala. By then, I was even in the US. I wasn't in Sierra Leone at all throughout the elections. And that is how I was called upon to lead the fight against corruption in my country. When I took over, the first thing I wanted to do was to ensure that there is a perceptual shift in the population to believe that corruption control is possible. I gave myself a period to say, I would be able to take steps to bring about this in six months. The most surprising realization is that when I tried in my own way, I am not perfect, or try to bring credibility in the fight against corruption. Investigating real corruption issues that the people have been yearning about over a period of time. Arresting senior members of government, including the vice, former vice president, who is currently standing trial. The former minister of mines, who is currently standing trial. And inviting people, the head of the National Revenue Authority, to investigate into billions that were stolen. The head of the National Security Agency. It took only a month 
for that perceptual shift to happen. If you go to Sierra Leone today and you speak to people, they are starting to believe that this can be done. I have had ministers do things behind closed doors when I am not there, and they call and report themselves. Say, oh, we did this today, but we did it because of X, Y, Z reasons. I hope we will not be held responsible for it. It is that kind of belief that Africa needs. It is what you do when nobody is watching that is important. It's not what you do when everybody is watching. So that realization that the people can believe in the fight against corruption and the in so short a time. So the impression you're giving now is that it is possible to make change happen, particularly as a young person who finds himself or herself at that very critical position of fighting corruption. But why do you think that for many years it almost seemed impossible? You see, fighting corruption, like Nuhu Rubadu of Nigeria said, is a complex situation. Because corruption is personified in people. These are people who have acquired, amassed serious wealth. And it is your responsibility to make sure instead of living in, in splendor, they should be in prison instead. Or rather, to stop young people like us who take on power, believing that that is the way to make it in life by being corrupt and amass wealth in short time, by preventing them from being capable of doing so. So they have to take the longer route. So it is difficult to fight corruption. But one important thing about the fight against corruption, and this is what we young people should advocate for and fight for, there has to be the political will at the top. I tell people, the president who appointed me came to power on the promise of anti-corruption reform. So in law, we say what we call estopel. He, he is not allowed to go back on his own words and his own promises. So I came in as anti-corruption on that promise, on that belief. And I can tell you, he has given myself and the team at the ACC huge powers, huge freedom to investigate into things and prosecute whosoever we find necessary. And he's also taking steps with his government to give us the resources to be capable of doing so. So it is that political will that is missing in several parts of Africa and in many countries. And it is the same political will that I believe did not exist when my predecessors were in office in Sierra Leone. The issue of political will remains at the center of many of this conversation. And I think that when we start the interactions, uh, some of the conversations will also speak about it. But I, I, I'm very happy that you, you brought that up uh, early enough because that has always been at the center of many of the conversations uh, on the fight against corruption. Uh, there is the will on the part of the agencies that want to fight corruption, but then there's always that uh, invisible big brother hand, yes, that uh, says, well, you can't go after this, you can't touch this, you can do that, you can do this. Uh, and, and we see that that's progress in Sierra Leone. So I think we should put our hands together for Sierra Leone. Um, one of the things that we also try to do with the annual regional consultation is to celebrate our member states who are doing very well. Uh, because if we celebrate them, others will see a reason to also want to be celebrated. So, uh, and that's very important for us. We would have, a, we would have an interaction now over the next 40 minutes. Uh, and um, we would like to take numbers. We'll start from the left side of the hall. Uh, I see one and two. Uh, one, two, three on this side. And then we come to this side. I see one, two, three, four, five. So we'll start uh, with uh, the lady. Thank you. My name is Esther Tiria, and I'm from Ghana. So I hear people talk about political will. And seriously, I'm beginning to think that we, we are just using the word because everybody has accepted it. I think the problem we are facing on the continent in the fight against corruption is personal interest. How do we override personal interest with our national interest? First of all, the president appoints almost everybody in the country. And as you are here, you mentioned that you are appointed by your president. And your president's interest should be your interest. So in the event that you are doing anything that is contrary to what the president wants you to do, what do you do? I mean, almost every institution in Africa 
you don't get somebody who says, I was working there and I've been through the ranks and file and I've been the leader. Every person is appointed by the president and obeys the rules and, I mean, the, 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 the desires of the president, basically. Okay. So how do you deal with this interest? As, oh. as somebody who is fighting corruption in your country. And again, how do you really bring young people on board? All the things that you are doing in your country, it, with the appointment and everything, how were young people really included with the incident that happened in your parliament? I mean, that's a bridge of uh, uh, power because you think you have the power, you can do whatever you want to do for parliamentarians to be asked out of parliament and police ordering them what did you do about it, if you can? Okay. About it. All right. Um, for the next questions, please introduce yourself, your organization, your country. Keep it extremely short. And then your question directly. Number two. Okay. Um, my name is Ode. Um, from Nigeria. I will work with Accountability Lab. Um, so I'm really excited with your presentation. Um, permits me to ask for your presentation, um, a document I needed. Um, I was really excited you mentioned a couple of things about integrity and building um, the capacity of young people in the secondary schools and universities and all that. Um, but I'll go back to what she just said, not to repeat what she said, but we've heard about political wills in different spaces. Um, we have a case scenario from Nigeria, which makes you feel like when you say political will, like fighting the opposition party. So how do you handle that political will in your own space and not make it political? So how do we cultivate political will in itself? Um, yeah. Because the point actually that Mr. Kaifala made was that as young people, what we should actually focus on is cultivating that political will. So I think that um, in, in consolidating uh, or supporting the, uh, the question, you know, how do we actually do this as young people? Okay. Uh, number three. Uh, Okay, so let's take the last one on this side and then we move here. Number three. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Mohamed Kane. Uh, I work with the West African Youth Network in Sierra Leone. Um, Francis, I must have to congratulate you in the first place for your drive so far. But um, it appears also to us in Africa that sometimes what we see as solution, we also see it as a taboo in the respective countries that we are coming from, because there is this whole idea of uh, powers from above. Now, um, we have in our country asset declaration that is done uh, in secrecy. How are we actually to also ensure the transparent and corrupt free aspect of that? When uh, officials come into office, you Citizens are not actually aware of what they had before assuming the office. And uh, when they leave also, you hardly know. So um, based on that, basically, how do we ensure that uh, we really live a corrupt-free society? Because uh, corruption is not only about running after the, the small thieves and leaving out the, the, the bigger ones in bigger offices. And we all know very well that uh, in Africa, uh, we are there are stamps. They sell stamps and, and receipt books. It is very much easy to corrupt. How do we go about solving that? Okay, issues of asset declaration and personal ethics. So we'll take the, the three and then yes. we move to the next slide. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. I, I forgot, I didn't get your name from Ghana, Esther, yes. And uh, your question is about the appointment by the president. Yes. You see, when there are certain things we have to take. For example, mandates. Mandates come from law. There is nothing you can do about it if you don't reform that law. Yes, it is true that the president appoints you. It is also true that the president is a very important figure within the political landscape of every country. The reason why political will is not a myth as you are trying to present it is that even those who fight corruption operate in an environment. I'm sure you've heard the stories around Africa of people who tried to fight corruption, but the political will was not there and they took it too far. Nuri Badu, for example, had to escape for his life from Nigeria. 
Professor Lumumba in Kenya, the entire institution was disbanded. Everywhere across Africa, there are stories of people who attempted to fight corruption when there was... And it's not just Africa. If you go to the Caribbeans, the Caribbeans, the parliament can just wake up one day and say, in fact, these people are going too far. We have to remove it. So political will is not a myth. Accepting it is the beginning of our wisdom. The question now is what we do with it. You see, for example, in my country, the only person that is exempt for criminal prosecution is the president by the constitution itself. He's the only sacred cow created by law. Now, knowing that, my focus is not the president. But if I have the mandate and will from him to go after every other person else and the support to do so, I think that is enough to establish what is. I didn't pass the law that made him a sacred cow. If you were not so, if we are here under my mandate, that would have been a different ball game. But I can assure you that political will is very much alive. And if you occupy a position like I do, you understand how that works. So you mentioned the issue of parliamentarians being walked out of parliament. Again, the job, the, the, the appointment of the anti corruption commissioner is political. Make no mistake about it. It is the product of politicking that appoints the commission, and that again comes from law. However, it is your job which ought to be a political. Now that I occupy that office, I have to do my job not based on politics. Whatever happened in parliament, parliamentarians being worked out, parliamentarians being prevented from doing what they can do, is politics. These are politicians, that is what they do. I am not a politician. I have a job to stand up for my people against people who are corrupt so that we can change the story of Sierra Leone, a country which, as you know, is one of the richest in the world, not just Africa, when it comes to resources, but lies at the bottom of the Human Development Index. That is the focus that we have now, and we are trying to, to, to move things forward. Um, you said about uh, political will also. I hope this also answers your question. We can cultivate political will by making sure that politicians understand that this is the fight for the soul of the country which they themselves are leading. And you as an individual can help it to work, first of all, by making yourself credible to your people. By taking conscientious steps that are not political. By producing results for them. Results that are in the interest of the people. As commissioner, you have to be the people's commissioner even when you are appointed by the president. If you fail to do so, you are finished. And that is my goal. My goal is to bring the people of Sierra Leone along as I fight corruption. And I believe it should be the goal of every anti-corruption agency in the world to make sure that the people of that country own the fight against corruption. It will be the best political will that you can have because then... If the president interferes with you or the parliamentarians interfere with your work, they will be punished. They can be punished. And the way they can be punished is elections. Every politician is afraid of that punishment. On the issue that Mr. Kane raised about asset declarations, again, we go back to where I started. The mandate. Section, section 119, I believe, of the Anti-Corruption Act of Sierra Leone says that asset declaration by public officials shall be done in private and in secret. That is the mandate by law. If I am made commissioner and that law is not reformed, I will be breaking the law when, for example, the president declares assets to me, and I go and make it public. I don't think that is what Mr. Kane would want. So, Mr. Kane, the best thing to do in such a situation is what we do. Advocacy. Let us reform the law. I would want every politician to say I have five houses at the time I become ex-official. So, when he leaves and he has 15 houses, we are easily capable of identifying what he can. But if the law says that the asset declaration shall be in private and in secret, 
I cannot. I am not above the law as commissioner. The only thing I can do is to make sure that the politician declares his assets and I track it over the years that his office so that he leaves, I can be able to make him accountable to the people of Sierra Leone. So, Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, where are you? The mandate is with you. Go and ask the parliamentarians to, to change the law. The moment they do, trust me, I will follow it to the letter. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I think that's a very important point to make. Uh, and, and, and why this is a very interesting conversation for me is because uh, oftentimes when we are outside, uh, and you, you were a very popular activist before you got into office, um, uh, the, the challenge is that as an activist, you have a different perception of the office. Uh, when you then get into office, you, you have a more realistic perception of the office. Uh, and I think it's very important when young people like us who are in the office are telling us clearly the problem lies in our laws. Yeah, we, we have to pay attention to that. As we've seen with Not Too Young to Run in Nigeria and many other countries project 18 in Cameroon, where as young people, you can be jailed at 18, you can... Uh, at 18. You know, uh, it's in the law. Uh, and so we, I think that one of the things we've overlooked for a very long time is our laws. And we have to pay a lot. Closely related to that also is the, you know, the centrality of the parliament to the reforms that we want to see in our countries. So we'll go to, 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 the, to the right side and I'll start with my boss, uh, Mr. Pamusa, please. Merci beaucoup. Uh... Je m'appelle Zakaria, c'est un autre Zakaria, mais Zakaria euh, Pamoussa Konsembo. Pour ma part, ce n'est pas une question, c'est plutôt une contribution. C'est une contribution, un message de la part de Madame la Commissaire aux Affaires politiques de l'Union africaine, qui est également dans son portefeuille un certain nombre de dossiers, les dossiers de la gouvernance, les dossiers de la, des élections, les, des, les dossiers des droits de l'homme, les dossiers des questions humanitaires. Et son engagement, en tout cas à, aux côtés de la jeunesse, elle n'est pas là aujourd'hui, mais elle me charge de vous transmettre son message sa foi à la jeunesse et elle salue ce thème, la pertinence de ce thème, la jeunesse et l'avenir du continent. Aujourd'hui, euh, si nous nous replongeons dans l'histoire, on vous dira, il y a quelques années, le Ghana était au même niveau de développement que la Corée. Le Maroc était au même niveau de développement que telle ou telle puissance aujourd'hui. Seul le continent africain star. Mais vous allez voir que dans les recettes qui ont permis à ces pays d'émerger, il y a nécessairement la lutte contre la corruption. Eh bien, aimez-vous le, le continent africain Voulez-vous que, que vos nations se développent il faut que nous nous engagions dans la lutte contre la corruption. Mais la corruption, elle avertit, la corruption, c'est un phénomène malveillant. C'est un phénomène qui se manifeste sous plusieurs formes. Et pour lutter contre la corruption, c'est un engagement personnel. Nous devons vivre des valeurs des valeurs de dignité, des valeurs de confiance en soi. Parce que la corruption, c'est un phénomène, si vous n'allez pas vers elle, elle vient vers vous. Donc c'est une question de résistance. C'est donc pour ça que elle voudrait, pour en finir, pour ne pas prendre le temps, vous invitez à un slogan, à un slogan, et si tous les jeunes Africains 
opte et porte ce slogan, nous irons de l'avant. Ce slogan, c'est « La corruption ne passera pas par moi ». Tout simplement, si chacun dans son fort intérieur, dans sa vie quotidienne, vit avec ça, nous allons gagner la lutte contre la corruption et certainement, nous allons voir nos, nos nations se développer. C'est ça le message que je voulais apporter de la part de la commissaire Minata Samate. Je vous remercie. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Famusa. Uh, the message is very clear that we must uphold uh, personal integrity by saying clearly and of course believing in what we say that corruption does not include me. Uh, and once we start from that point, we would be able to uh, address the issue of corruption even in broader uh, and more deeper ways. We'll go to number two now, please. Bien, bonjour à tous. Je suis Narcis Kiwari, uh, contrôleur de gestion à l'Agence de régulation des postes et des communications du Congo. Et je suis un jeune uh, engagé dans le civisme au travers de l'association Yali Congo. Alors, euh, ma question va porter, ou plutôt, va, c'est une demande de, de plus d'éclaircissement sur le concept d'abord de gouvernance, ensuite de volonté politique, et finalement leur lien avec la corruption. Pour être plus précis, euh, à mon sens, la, la mauvaise gouvernance et la corruption s'interchangent les rôles. C'est un peu comme demander, selon moi, entre la poule et l'œuf qui vient avant. Dans une organisation, lorsqu'il n'y a pas des, des textes, lorsqu'il n'y a pas une, une gouvernance bien clarifiée, ben, c'est la porte ouverte, c'est un boulevard pour que tout le monde fasse ce qu'il veut, à moins que l'autorité, le responsable, ait un certain niveau d'éthique professionnelle et d'intégrité. Et en contrepartie aussi, dans la société, la corruption peut ouvrir à la porte à beaucoup d'autres mots. Donc, j'ai bien suivi votre intervention et je n'ai pas pu bien mettre la ligne de démarcation entre... Le, la volonté politique, à quel moment intervient vraiment la volonté politique, et puis la mauvaise gouvernance, quoi. La gouvernance ou mauvaise gouvernance. Voilà, voilà brièvement ce, ce que je voudrais avoir comme éclaircissement. Merci. All right, thank you very much. Uh, number three. Merci. Euh, je suis Christian Munzeo, je viens du Congo-Brazzaville. Euh, je travaille pour une organisation des droits de l'homme appelée Rencontre pour la paix et les droits de l'homme. Et je travaille également pour le compte de la campagne publique ce que vous payez, qui est une campagne engagée en ce qui concerne la transparence dans la gestion des ressources naturelles. Euh, évidemment, votre exposé a été particulièrement interpellant. Euh, vous avez parlé de volonté politique, vous avez ré, euh, remarqué que euh, presque tous les intervenants ici sont revenus sur la question de la volonté politique. Et moi, personnellement, ça m'a interpellé parce que euh, euh, lorsque vous faites attention, euh, tous les gouvernants vous parleront de volonté politique, vous diront qu'ils sont engagés. Et c'est pour ça, euh, arrivé à ce stade, et tout, je m'interroge. La volonté politique, qu'est-ce que c'est euh, Est-ce... Euh, euh, la garantie d'assurer que publiquement on a fait la déclaration sur l'engagement en matière de lutte contre la corruption Est-ce que euh, volonté politique euh, euh, signifie le président de mon pays, euh, il a dit qu'il est contre la corruption, euh, il a pris des lois anti-corruption, il a mis en place des structures anti-corruption euh, Je veux dire, tout l'arsenal qui devrait permettre euh, de pouvoir euh, se motiver contre la corruption existe. Mais de la littérature euh, en matière de corruption qui existe autant dans le pays qu'ailleurs, on, on sait que euh, c'est lui qui est le premier des corrupteurs. Sa famille, ses enfants euh, euh, sont totalement corrompus parce que c'est eux qui ont pris en otage effectivement euh, le pays et ses ressources. Euh, vous dites euh, pour cela, il faut il faut s'engager euh, euh, personnellement parce que c'est vous qui avez la capacité d'élire euh, les autorités. Euh, et les autorités ont peur des élections. Mais vous ne mentionnez pas le fait que euh, 
les élections ne suffisent pas pour que euh, les gens soient au pouvoir ou s'y maintiennent, parce que justement les processus électoraux sont totalement corrompus. Et donc, euh, pour parler de volonté politique, j'ai envie de, de, de comprendre. Est-ce que euh, on dirait volonté politique, c'est exclusivement le fait, euh, effectivement, de faire des déclarations publiques ou de de, de faire des lois qui ne sont finalement pas du tout respectées. Et ça, c'est la première observation que je voulais faire. Euh, cette conférence n'a de sens et d'intérêt, en tout cas pour moi, que si il y a un véritable partage d'expérience sur ce que les uns et les autres ont appris ou apprennent tous les jours dans le cadre de cette lutte que nous sommes en train de mener. Vous, en tant que euh, euh, personne qui a travaillé dans la commission anticorruption au niveau de la Sierra Leone, j'ai envie d'apprendre euh, non pas au-delà des résultats que vous avez obtenus, mais je veux apprendre de vos échecs. Euh, quels ont été vos défis euh, Comment vous les avez soldés Si vous aviez des conseils à partager après votre mandat aujourd'hui, qu'est-ce que vous conseillerez par rapport aux défis, effectivement, que euh, vous avez euh, soulignés Mais le travail que vous avez fait est un travail, on va le dire comme ça, pour une personne comme moi, j'ai été en prison plusieurs fois, euh, parce que j'ai posé des questions. Euh, vous avez fait ce travail. Je vous vois, vous êtes là. Ça veut dire que quelque part, vous avez euh, su protéger votre intégrité. Vous avez su vous protéger. C'est ce qui a permis que vous soyez là encore avec nous pour partager. Mais la question du rétrécissement de l'espace dans lequel la société civile travaille est une problématique que nous devons porter ici. Parce que effectivement. Si la société civile n'est pas libre, si elle n'est pas indépendante, si elle ne travaille pas dans un contexte d'intégrité, elle ne pourra pas du tout agir. Les jeunes, de la même façon, on voit au Sénégal, on voit, euh, comment dire, les mouvements comme Yonamar, on voit euh, des mouvements ras-le-bol au Congo-Brazzaville, etc. Okay. Mais on sait qu'à travers l'engagement de ces jeunes, la, la, comment dire, les instruments de répression se sont aussi mis en place pour pouvoir les empêcher d'agir. Alors, je veux aussi que vous ayez un partage sur les aspects qui sont liés à la protection. Quelles suggestions vous avez Nous aussi, on a des suggestions, on partagera au cours de la conférence. Merci. Ok, merci beaucoup. Uh, number four. Yes, take the floor. Good afternoon. My name is Bright, so I work for the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition. I'm afraid, my, I also have to focus on the issue of political will. I'm beginning to see that it's something that matters to everybody in every country where we come from, because really it is an issue. And it's more of a contribution than a question. Now, like my colleague said, sometimes there are declarations, he said, by the political top, that want to come in and want to fight corruption. And he said laws are passed, a lot of uh, what might seem like commitments are shown, but really, and because we focus on the issue of the independence of corruption institutions, I'd like to submit that another way in which politicians are about to talk about political will in one breath, but seem to dribble all of us, is about providing resources for those institutions to work. So in most of our countries, you find out that the anti-corruption institutions are staff of the resources they actually need to be able to work effectively. From budgeting from one year to another, they ask one amount, they are given They are able to say one thing in one breath, but in the actions show that they don't really mean it. And I think, Mr. Kaifala, you are blessed to have a regime that actually supports you, and you've made you know, reference to that. It does not pertain to most of the countries that we come from. But again, you said something that I would like to reiterate, that even when it is missing at the top, we can arouse it from bottom, make corruption an issue. Because like you said, politicians care about what the people care about. If they do not get, they have to pretend they do just to win the elections. And once we are there also, we need to monitor that you deliver to us. And so, be able to carry the citizens along on this issue of corruption. Be able to sensitize and let them know the effects having on us. And they need to fight it. It's very important in making corruption an agenda in elections. I think some countries in Africa have already started the process. But that needs to spread. That for too long, our elections have been about infrastructure, about services, and about roads and all kinds of things.